All right, everybody. Well, seeing as it's just a few minutes past seven, I think I'll go ahead and start getting us going here with today's Flojo webinar. I'm really enjoying the chat and seeing where everybody's joining in the world today. To my surprise, there were quite a few people most likely joining us from the States, which was surprising to me because it's um, at least where I am right now in Atlanta, Georgia, um, it's about seven o'clock at night. So right around dinner time. So for those of you that are skipping dinner or delaying dinner to attend this session, um, I hope you enjoy what we have to discuss today. Um, and for those of you joining us um, overseas, I guess for you, it's probably closer to breakfast time perhaps. Um, so thank you for joining us so early in the morning. Um, but wherever you are in the world, I'm really happy to have you here today um, as we, I, I believe for the first time, have a whole webinar dedicated to looking at spectral data inside Flojo software. And I think what we'll learn is that a lot of how we approach data that comes off a spectral instrument in terms of an analysis perspective is really quite the same, um, but there might be some special tools you might need to evaluate the quality of your compensation um, and maybe just look at your data in a different way than we have opportunities to do when we collect it on a traditional cytometer. But all in all, the downstream analysis, as well as all the rules for sample prep, um, tend to be the same. So we don't ignore those, but we just give special consideration to the extra spectral profiles that we can pull off a spectral cytometer. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the format will be that we're going to open with a few slides. So I'll spend maybe 20 or 30 minutes in a PowerPoint presentation, just covering some themes and key topics. And then I'll spend the rest of the time in the software doing just a quick demo of some of these tools so that you'll know how to find them inside of Flojo software. So a couple of housekeeping things. This webinar is being recorded, so if, as long as I remember to do so, I will show you where on our website you can retrieve this recording at a later time if there's anything that you would like to rewatch. Second is you don't have an ability to unmute, I don't believe, to um, speak up in the session if you have a question, but you can put your question in the chat, and that would probably be the easiest way for me to see it. Um, so at any point, if you have a question or would like some clarification on anything, just drop it in the chat. I'll do my best to keep an eye on it and answer questions as they come up. Lastly, um, I to introduce myself, my name is Veronica Obregón Perco, and I'm a senior scientific advisor with Informatics of BD, so offering support for Flojo software, but also single cell analysis in general and informatics solutions for that. Here is my email. So at the end of this session, if you have any lingering questions or you would like some more information about anything that we cover, um, here's my email. Feel free to reach out. You can also reach out to our tech support team, um, flojo at bd.com. Um, and that way, um, if you have any um, technical questions about installing the software or you have external plugins that aren't working well that you hear about today, um, you can always reach out to them. They're a very responsive group. All right, so that being said, let's go ahead and dive into our topic today. So let me go ahead and grab a laser pointer, and here we go. So for those of you that are less familiar with the differences between conventional and spectral flow cytometry, let's go ahead and address that early. So I've got just really just one or two slides here just to address what the main difference is between these cytometry technologies. So with conventional flow cytometry, which is what we've been doing um, pretty much since the advent of um, flow cytometry, I mean, you know, decades ago, is we're only collecting a discrete portion of an emission spectrum, right? So we tend to think of it as a single filter per fluorochrome. So if I'm measuring FITSI, I see that it peaks in a particular filter in the blue detector array. And I, when I want to measure FITSI and separate it out from other colors, I pretty much devote my attention to just that filter that it emits in. And every other filter that it spills into, we kind of just refer to that as spillover. And we used to just ignore that and right, give most of our attention to the filter where we saw that peak signal. But with spectral flow cytometry, we're now taking advantage of the fact that because dyes that might otherwise behave very similarly in one filter might behave very differently in other filters, we can use that to our advantage to separate them from one another. So we can fill previously all these gaps in the full spectrum of light that we used to have. Um, so if you've ever seen a spectrum viewer to um, design a panel or to look at a cytometer configuration, you know, you'll see just a handful of detectors um, for each of the laser arrays. But um, now with spectral cytometry, right, we fill all of those gaps with a bunch of detectors 
then we can collect a full spectral signature um, for any dyes that we acquire on that instrument. So the short story is basically we collect a lot more information that we were able to collect before um, with now having these spectral configurations on cytometers, right? So they're all a means to the same end. It's to get more information um, from these dyes. And because we get more information, we get a lot more flexibility in different aspects of flow cytometry. We can do larger panels because now we can fill these gaps that previously we weren't really collecting data from, but now we have an ability to. So our panels can get larger. A lot of the large high parameter panels you're seeing published in the literature, so 40 plus colors, are coming off spectral instruments just because they do such a great job of being able to expand that repertoire. We can now use very similar fluorochromes. We'll talk about that more in this talk. But before, you know, if two dyes peaked in the same detector, we really couldn't use them together because the compensation wouldn't be able to separate them out. Um, but now that we have all of these other extra detectors, there might be differences in those detectors that allow us to separate two dyes that before would be indistinguishable right? on a, on a lower detector traditional cytometer. And not that we couldn't do autofluorescence subtraction on a traditional cytometer, but with a spectral cytometer, because we have so many more detectors, we really get a stronger ability to profile that autofluorescence and ultimately subtract it. Now, as I mentioned before, these are some of the benefits of spectral flow cytometry, right? They allow us to get more information, more flexibility with our panel design. But ultimately, a lot of the rules are still the same, right? You still have to prepare your sample very carefully. Filtration is still important. Titrating antibodies, all of that is still important. Having appropriate gating controls when it comes time for the analysis, like preparing a positive control, a negative control, fluorescence minus one controls for gate placement. And a lot of aspects of panel design are also the same. So we'll talk about some distinctions between spectral panel design and traditional flow panel design. Um, but a lot of the rules still apply, which is that we don't want to use dyes that basically look the same once we run them on the instrument. But again, you'll see as we go through our themes today that we do still get that flexibility. So it's a really powerful technology. Um, and I, I think it's becoming obvious why the field is moving towards um, this kind of technology, especially as we enter the high parameter arena. So I mentioned that a lot of aspects of your data analysis, whether it comes from a traditional cytometer or a spectral cytometer, are ultimately going to be the same, right? Once we process the files to do the compensation and things like that, the our approach for establishing gates to find populations, if we ultimately want to enter computational tools like TISNI or clustering and things of that nature, all of that will still be the same, whether the data is spectral or not. But there are some tools that we might want to take advantage of while we're preparing to enter these computational pipelines or preparing to enter an analysis, right? So all of this in the pre-processing stage. And really a lot of it ties around the quality of the compensation or the unmixing. So when we're thinking about spectral data, we have to think about compensation in a slightly different way, right? It's ultimately a means to the same end, which is to separate out the contribution of signal from each of the respective dyes in your panel. Um, but with spectral compensation, we're actually doing unmixing, right? Unmixing all of those signals from one another instead of just appreciating the signal in a single detector and eliminating everything else. And we also want to make sure that our panels are performing very well. Right? As these panels get larger and larger, the, the resolution between populations um, can sometimes be impeded, but we need to make sure that that resolution is top notch. So spectral compensation and the, the performance of your panel becomes metrics that someone would desire right? as they enter um, spectral data. We also might want to have a desire to do autofluorescence subtraction, right? Since we have so many more detectors, we can profile the natural emission of light that cells give off, even if they're not stained with any antibodies. And as we'll learn in the slides later, sometimes that signal uh, might impede the detection of our target signal, right? And so since we're collecting so much more information, we might inadvertently be collecting more autofluorescence from our cells, and that might run into problems when we start doing the analysis. And lastly, it would be really helpful to be able to look at full spectral signatures away from the cytometer. Right? So if you're at a spectral cytometer, chances are when you're setting up the compensation there or just acquiring the samples, you have an opportunity to see full spectral signatures um, of your single stain controls and maybe even of your fully stained ones as well. 
Um, but typically those views were reserved only at the cytometer. Um, and it, it would be hard to see that data once you left the acquisition software and once you're in an analysis software like Flojo. And there have been some packages in statistical environments like R that have allowed you to visualize this, um, but without coding experience, they were a little unattainable and you didn't have an opportunity to, to revisit that data. Well, the good news is, you know, over the past um, two version releases or so for Flojo software, um, we've really tried to, you know, keep up with this growing technology and incorporate things into our software um, that would help users attack their spectral data analysis, more so from the aspect of, you know, compensation and uh, quality control and things of that nature. So here's some of the solutions we're going to talk about in today's session. So we'll talk about the compensation wizard and the features it has to support spectral unmixing and ways we can evaluate our panel performance and see if we've designed it well or if there's room for improvement. We also now have tools to subtract out autofluorescence so we can see that in our data. And we have a couple of methods within the compensation wizard to be able to subtract out autofluorescence. Lastly, we have very beautiful spectral plots. So that allows us to look at full spectral signatures whether in your fully stained sample, just because you want to see the, the full you know, range of markers that a sample could be expressing, or to look back at your single stain controls and make sure those spectra match perhaps like the reference spectra that comes for that reagent from the manufacturer that makes it to make sure you didn't have any contamination during the acquisition phase um, or that you're not having some kind of tandem degradation or anything like that. So let's talk about different spectral compensation methods, right? What are some of the things we can take advantage of in Flojo software? And what are some extra features that maybe are not available at the cytometer, but would be available if I import my data into the software? So let's first establish what do we mean by spectral compensation, right? And why is it have its own dedicated, say, webinar versus just having one on, you know, compensation alone where we cover all of these, right? So is, is spectral compensation really much different than traditional compensation? And I think what we'll find is that they're largely the same, um, but we're just thinking about spillover in different ways, right? So with spectral compensation, also called unmixing, and I think it'll become clear on the next slide why we call it unmixing, um, spectral refers to using the full spectrum of the fluorescence signal, right? So that becomes easier to appreciate when we look at this full spectral plot here. So rather than just have um, each of these um, detector arrays um, separated by a laser line where OFITC will only emit in the blue detector array or APC will only emit in the red detector array, so we kind of just ignore everything else. Here, we're looking at a sample or a single stain control and seeing where it emits in every single detector. And with that, we establish basically a fingerprint, right, for each of the single stain controls. And we use that fingerprint to separate it from the other fingerprints, right, the other single stain controls that are in our experiment. And if we bring in a fully stained sample, then we're basically just seeing everything that is that that sample is emitting into all the detectors. And so because we're using this full spectrum here, um, we get better coverage of that light spectrum right for each of the individual samples. So a more complete picture of the signal and a cleaner estimate of the portion of the signal that's primary versus spillover. And so again, paying attention to all the detectors rather than just bringing our focus to one. And the reality is that any cytometer can technically behave like a spectral cytometer as long as it has more detectors than signals you're trying to measure, right? So for example, if you have a five color panel and you are running it on a cytometer that has uh, 10 detectors, and you're only using five of the 10 for your panel, maybe six if you count the scatter, um, but you're not using all of the detectors, right? Not every detector is being used for the colors in your panel. So technically, you could open all those detectors, right? Leave them all open. And that signal for your samples and your single stain controls will be collected even in the detectors that technically aren't being used as primaries for all of your um, colors in your panel. So we're collecting information from more detectors than colors we have in our panel. So in that way, even a low parameter traditional cytometer can behave like a spectral cytometer, right? If we open up all the detectors and collect all of that information. 
It's just that spectral cytometers are built to do a better job of this. And really it's because they have a lot of detectors, right? So here in this spectral plot, you can see that each of these columns is a detector on this instrument. So we've got dozens of different opportunities to collect signal um, versus maybe only eight opportunities to collect signal if you're using like a lower parameter traditional machine. And so it just gets a better fingerprint, if you will, and gets a more full picture. And so that's why spectral cytometers are, are built and marketed differently, um, because they have so many more uh, filters and detectors to capture that information. So here's just a cartoon to you know give you the short story of what is the difference between traditional compensation and spectral compensation, or what we call unmixing. So traditional compensation Let's say I have a three color panel here and I have a single stain control for each of the colors in my panel. And so I have a blue, green, and an orange. And with traditional compensation, I basically ask the question, which detector does the blue dye peak in? Well, it peaks in detector one, but it does still emit into detector two and three. We call that spillover. And we, that's basically what needs to get subtracted out of my full stain sample. Same for floor number two, it peaks in detector number two, spills over into one and three. This is spillover, ultimately what I need to subtract out in the process of compensation. Okay, so it goes through this in an iterative manner for each of your single stain controls so that it can learn what each individual dye looks like so we can compensate out spillover from the mixture of dyes in our full stain sample. Now with spectral compensation, it's a means to the same end, right? We still want to be able to separate out the different colors from the fully stained sample. But because we have all of these detectors, we can use them to our advantage to help um, separate out the colors from one another, right? So with traditional compensation, I'm focused only on the primary, right? And everything else is spillover. But here I'm using that full spectral signature and making essentially this whole histogram and asking how that histogram is different from the other dyes. It's, that's the short story of what's happening in traditional compensation versus spectral. And there's a lot of math on this slide, but I like having it because it illustrates, um, you know, how these are basically trying to get to the same thing, right? Basically just trying to understand the contribution of each of the individual dyes. But at the end of the day, when you do traditional compensation, you're gonna have a square matrix because you're gonna have one color in your panel for every detector that you're using. As we're with spectral cytometry, we're gonna end up with a rectangular matrix because we're gonna have a completely overdetermined system. And right? we'll have way more detectors than colors in our panel. So you're gonna end up with a rectangular matrix. So that's one way to tell what kind of compensation has been done on the data, at least inside Flojo, um, because one would be square for traditional, the other would be rectangular for spectral. And that's because we're considering all the detectors right? instead of just ignoring the ones we didn't even use in the panel. So if you are interested in doing spectral compensation or unmixing right inside of Flojo software, what does the workflow look like? Okay, we'll go through this in the demo portion of the webinar, but just to kind of set the stage, all of our um, compensation and unmixing tools can be found in what's called the compensation wizard. So the requirement to launch the compensation wizard inside of Flojo software is you of course have to load in your single stain controls and they have to be members of the compensation group once they are in the compensation group, um, they can be um, activated to load automatically from the compensation wizard. And then once we launch the wizard, basically what happens is your single stain controls, they will try to be auto assigned to what, what Flojo thinks it's his primary detector. Um, doesn't always get it right. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but essentially it does its best guess to say, this sample seems like it belongs in this detector. This sample goes in this detector. It does that partly off of naming convention and how you've named the files. Um, after all of that, right, you establish um, some exemplar gating, right? We have to tell the compensation algorithm, what is a negative signal and what is a positive signal, right? And the reason we have to do that for each of our single stain controls is because we need to use those MFIs to understand the contribution of spillover into secondary channels. So we have um, webinars that you know go deeper into the theory of compensation if you would like to learn more about those, um, the math behind establishing the gates and, and all of that. And the focus today is just gonna be more so on spectral features, but just know that whether you're doing compensation at the machine or in Flojo software um, in a traditional manner, 
exemplar negative and exemplar positive gates are going to be needed. Okay. Um, and then, you know, because we have spectral data and we have these full spectral signatures, um, you also have an opportunity to establish your exemplar gates in a different way. Um, so for those of you familiar with the compensation wizard, you know, as you're launching that window, um, you'll have an opportunity to open graph windows like in this display here, and you can set range gates for what you think is the exemplar negative, what you think is the exemplar positive for that single stain control. Um, but you could also take advantage of our spectral plots feature. And if you establish a gate in that view, like in this example, I've looked for the, um, you know, the B, I think it's the 510 detector, and I grabbed what I thought was the most intense region of the B510 signal, right, for that sample, drew a gate around it, and uh, used that instead for my exemplar gate, right? So it's still going to be represented as a histogram, most likely here in the preview, um, but you get an opportunity to establish that gate outside of the histogram view, and you can do it in a full spectral signature view. So that's one utility of spectral plots inside Flojo, is you can bring in your single stain control, establish a gate, and use that gate um, really in downstream analysis, but also just use it to establish exemplar negative and positive inside the compensation wizard. And to enable the spectral compensation, there is a checkbox over on the far left of the window that says spectral. So when you check that box, that basically tells Flojo that you want it to do spectral and mixing, and so it'll perform the, the math such that you get the rectangular matrix because it's considering the, the full spectral signatures, right? So considering all the detectors versus just a one-to-one -one pairing that we get with traditional. Now, this is very important. So because you're going to have more detectors than you do single stain controls, right, more than colors than in your panel, um, Flojo won't proceed unless you remove these detectors that don't have single stain controls. Okay, So that doesn't mean they're not being used in the calculation for unmixing. It's just telling Flojo you don't have single stain controls for these, um, so you want to clear them from the view. Okay, So you need to remove unused parameters after the fluorochrome stain matching is complete. And it's a simple right-click, remove unused parameters. We'll go through that in the demo. Um, but that's partly why you'll see a lot of these little red buttons because it's confused that it doesn't have a sample. So we just remove those and tell it, I'm not going to put a sample there, but I'm still considering these detectors when I do the unmixing. So even after or, you know, after, or you could consider this during, right, before you do the calculation, we can consider opportunities right, to optimize our spectral compensation to really make sure that we get good resolution of our populations. Right? So we'll talk about spread here in a little bit, but spread is basically the idea um, that we could kill the separation between um, what would be a negative and a positive population. Right. So the, the wider our populations are um, into a detector when we're you know, looking at, say, two different populations, um, the harder it could be to establish cutoffs with your gating. Right? So we always want to make sure that we have a nice separation between populations as much as possible. Um, but that can start to get challenging um, as we get um, larger panels or we start having complex phenotypes where we have a lot of co-expression of different markers. So we do have an opportunity inside of Flojo software if you choose to calculate or recalculate your spectral and mixing there, and that's to perform um, an optimization of weights. Okay, so what is that doing exactly? So another simple example here, three different colors, blue, green, and orange. And so let's say I ultimately need to separate out these three colors in, right, in the process of unmixing. Um, but because they have such similarity in certain parts of the spectra, I might run into some spread issues when it comes time to do gating based on uh, the measurements out of these detectors. Right? Maybe one corresponds to an activation marker and two others correspond to exhaustion markers. So I'm going to have some co-expression of these and I want to make sure that I've got good separation. So if I ultimately am concerned right, with being able to separate the blue dye, say from the green and the orange, right, rather than consider detector one, two, and three equally right, in the ability to unmix these colors, I might get more information if I consider the detectors that have discriminatory power for the blue dye. Right? So let's walk through that example. So here you can see I have the blue dye. And in detector one, right, the blue dye looks like the orange dye. In detector two, the blue dye looks like the orange and the green dye, right? Maybe one's a little more intense, but ultimately they're, they're both emitting there. And in detector three, 
blue is quite discreet, right? Quite, quite distinct. It, it peaks there nicely, right? Whereas the other two dyes don't as much. And so detector three is incredibly valuable in separating out the blue dye from the other two dyes. So perhaps I weight that detector more heavily than the other two, right? And if I were gonna pick between detector one and detector two, after detector three, maybe detector one would be a decent choice because it's, it's it at least emits a little more to the left um, than the orange dye does. And so this algorithm will basically do that right, in an iterative manner for each of the colors right, and go through each of the detectors and weight the ones that basically give more discriminatory power for that reagent. Right? And the end game there is to be able to tease true signal away from the background so that we can mitigate spread. Again, optimize the separation between a negative and a positive population. Now I'll tell you, if you are interested in running this inside Flojo, and, and I'll try to say this again during the demo, the optimization, it can take some time to run. Um, it's computationally expensive. Um, so it's not something you can click and then immediately view the compensation matrix. Um, it will have to run in the background for, you know, I, I would say probably between, anywhere between 15 and 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so it is gonna take some time, but those weights can be exported um, and in theory, re-imported and considered again, if you are doing unmixing on say the same panel, the same type of experimental setup, the same instrument. Um, so something to think about, um, could make a difference in the resolution of your populations, um, may make no difference at all, but it's, it's there as an opportunity to try to minimize spread if you're dealing with that in your data. Another opportunity to try to minimize spread um, is a new um, technology that has been developed as part of BD's new um, instrument, the Facts Discover S8 platform. Um, so at least in Flojo software, this spectral effects optimization is reserved only for data off the Facts Discover S8. Um, so if you are considering using that instrument or you have that instrument now available to you, you have an opportunity to implement this optimization inside Flojo software, All right? So the idea is that it's a, a version of spectral unmixing, that again, only for the Facts Discover S8, um, but we can enable it in Flojo. And so it's using information about the instrument's noise levels um, to try to help mitigate spread, right? So try to just, again, enhance that separation between populations. Right? Um, so how is that enabled? So you bring in the data from the Facts Discover S8 instrument, if you hadn't already applied the BD spectral effects at that cytometer and you want to apply it inside Flojo software, it's a simple right click and there is an option that says apply spectral effects. So what is it doing? Okay, so here you can see some examples of how it could just, you know, give that boost of separation that one might desire. So you have here before BD spectral effects, right? I've got this quadrant of populations here and I've got a little bit of spread um, primarily in, in say like the double negative population, uh, maybe a little bit in the um, single positive in the UV2 detector here for CD14. And if we apply the spectral effects, right? We can see that it cleans up that population a bit, makes it a little more concise, have a better separation between um, the negative and the positive population here. Um, same for the CD14 single positive population as well. So a little bit of, of a boost of resolution between those populations. Um, and if you decide you don't like it, um, you can remove it off as well. But you at least get that toggle opportunity inside Flojo software. And for any data coming off the Facts Discover S8, um, for those of you that have not heard of that cytometer yet, um, we have a cell view lens webinar dedicated on our tool for visualizing data off the cytometer. Um, but the idea is that it's image-based sorting, so we can collect image features off that cytometer. So that's what you're seeing here. But added benefit that we get some boosting to the spectral mixing as well. So autospill, I decided to include it in our um, spectral data discussion here because it does have a spectral uh, unmixing implementation as well. So I thought it was relevant to talk about here. Um, so what is autospill? Um, it's a compensation approach that thinks about compensation a little bit differently than what I showed on the previous slides. Instead here, right, the authors propose that if we were to convert our uncompensated data into a linear scale, right, typically we visualize data on a bi-exponential scale, right, with a combination of linear and logarithmic. And that's really amenable for once we're establishing our gates, right, because it helps compress the, the lower values, which are in the negative population, and help expand out the ones that are positive. 
Um, but if we turn it to a linear scale, it becomes easy to see that we can model spillover um, in a linear fashion, right? And if we use a linear regression instead of this inversion matrix that we used previously, um, we can actually compensate out spillover in that manner. So what are the benefits of that? Well, if we just model spillover with a linear regression, instead of establishing gates to do MFI matching, so drawing a gate on the negative population, drawing a gate on the positive population, matching their MFIs into the secondary detector, we instead just model the full range of values across that sample here on a linear regression, and then just force that slope to go back to be straight, right? And so that's how we establish the compensation there. So you don't have to establish gates because it's just going to use the linear regression. It runs iteratively over and over until it finds an optimal matrix, right, where that, where that line is basically flat is the idea. It has the added benefit that while it's doing all this, it can also subtract out autofluorescence. Okay. So the idea is that it's easier cytometry uh, because we don't have to establish gates. Um, we just feed in our single stain controls. It gets modeled by a linear regression for spillover, and then we get that matrix to apply to our data. The other added benefit means that we can work with compensation controls that might be tricky to use otherwise. So I think for those of us that use beads for single stain controls, um, nothing wrong with beads. They, they fit a lot of cases. Um, but sometimes uh, it might become necessary to use cells uh, for single stain controls in your experiment. And when we do that, we sometimes struggle to get a signal for dimmer markers, and it might become challenging for a user to decide where their exemplar gate should go, right? Should, it, should my negative go here? And should the positive be just the brightest peak? Should it include the shoulder? Um, and it helps remove that layer of subjectivity and instead just let autospill use the full range of values. Okay, so we don't have to establish any gates. I think I see a question in the chat. Let me take a peek here. See, somebody says, um, I missed part of the presentation at the beginning. Yes, um, uh, to the user who asked about their recording, this session is being recorded. Um, so don't worry, I will mention at the end of the slides uh, where you can access this recording at a later time. So no worries there. No problem. Okay, so this is uh, basically one of the selling points of autospill, right? Because we don't have to establish gates, you remove that layer of confusion behind um, establishing the exemplar negative, exemplar positive. So if you are interested in using autospill in the compensation wizard, right, what's the setup? Um, it's very similar to the spectral and mixing, where we still have to bring in our single stain controls. They still have to be assigned to primary detectors. If we want to do the spectral implementation of autospill, you just have to check this spectral box again, which tells the algorithm to consider all the detectors when doing the unmixing. There's no exemplar gates, so you'll notice there's no range gates on these histograms. There's also no universal negative, right? So I don't need to establish a negative and a positive signal. It's just going to use that full range of signal across everything starting from the negative to the positive, but I'm not supervising what's negative and what's positive. Um, now, that being said, because there are no exemplar gates, it's going to be critical to have single stain controls that have a nice distribution of signal. So cells will likely do best here um, because beads typically have an on-off pattern. And if we only have two points for a linear regression, it's not a really strong curve, right? It's like having a standard curve for a PCR or an ELISA. If you only have two points, that's basically a line drawn between two points. The more points you have, the stronger that, that modeling of that curve can be. And it's the same idea here. So cells will be best. Worth trying with beads, it might be fine. But for autofluorescence subtraction, you're, of course, going to want to use cells. Now, whether you're going to use autospill or spectral and mixing, and whether you're doing traditional flow cytometry or spectral flow cytometry, I can't stress enough that good compensation controls are still going to be very important. Right? So it, I think it's worth mentioning the three rules of compensation right, that have been handed down from a, um, a, a very famous flow cytometrist and scientist, Mario Roderer. And they've held true over, over time, right? and, we, and we still follow them today. And it's important to follow these rules to make sure you succeed in spectral and mixing or even in traditional compensation or even in auto spill. Okay. The rules are basically that controls need to be at least as bright or brighter 
than any sample the compensation will be applied to. We have to estimate that spillover um, and we want to estimate it um, as well as possible, right? And if we have a, a really dim comp control that's not estimating the contribution of spillover into the other channels very well, or the full spectral signature very well as compared to the full stain control, it's going to be hard to do that subtraction. Oh, it looks like there's something in the Q&A box, which I didn't realize there was even a Q&A box for this webinar, so that helps. Um, so let me go through this slide and then I'll address that. Um, background fluorescence should be the same for the positive and the negative control. So if you're going to use um, a universal negative, so unstained beads or unstained cells, as the negative peak for all of your single stain controls, um, ideally we want them to have the same level of autofluorescence, so we appropriately subtract the background. Compensation controls must match the exact experimental fluorochrome. And this is actually more important for spectral and mixing because we're taking that full spectral signature. So you might see, for instance, PECF594 marketed as a PE Texas Red equivalent, right? And if you look at a traditional cytometer um, spectrum viewer, you'll see that they peak in the same detector. So you figure it's probably fine, right? The spillover might be, you know, hard to see. And so, but as long as they peak in the same area, it's okay. But remember in full spectral cytometry, we're going to consider all the detectors. So if one of those dyes emits in a detector array that the other one doesn't, it's going to be hard to train the machine how to separate that dye out in your panel. So very critical that they be the exact same fluorochrome, even the same lot um, is, is incredibly useful. And if you can, even expose it to the same reagents that your samples get during processing, right? Things like fixative, um, permeabilization buffer, those can impact fluorescent spectra, um, especially as we get more information about these dyes in the context of a full spectral signature. Um, so if you can, even if it's just compensation beads, it's worth treating them the same as your samples. Okay, let's look at the sample, I mean, the question in the Q&A box. Um, with multiple unstained controls, could be applied for autofluorescence subtraction, like non-induced and different induction stain controls? Yeah, Yelin, that is a good question. Um, we'll be getting to autofluorescence subtraction here in a second, um, but that's a good question. I, autofluorescence can be tricky, right? Sometimes, um, you know, you might think two different populations might have different autofluorescent signatures, but once you load them in software, you'll see that they're actually kind of the same. So it's negligible to worry about separating them. Or you could have that, like you mentioned, you might have some samples that once they're stimulated or we're kind of forcing that autofluorescence to, to be more prominent, um, you know, in which case, um, you know, what's the best approach, you know, one would be, you could go as granular as doing separate compensation matrices and, and applying those to your individual samples. Um, you could go with something like exporting populations where you suspect the autofluorescence is different and analyzing them separately so that they can get separate compensation matrices. Um, and as we'll talk about in a second, um, if you are going to do autofluorescence subtraction, um, you know, those would be approaches to do, um, you know, a matching, whereas I want to have monocyte autofluorescence modeled and subtracted strictly from monocytes, right? So that's definitely the, the golden standard way to do it. Or you could take a best guess of a heterogeneous population of cells like PBMC and, um, you know, expect that perhaps the autofluorescence, if we take the average effect of that mixture population, perhaps it's good enough to still subtract it um, even from the problematic population. Um, so I would I would do a trial and see, you know, how different those autofluorescent signatures are, are between your samples before going down, you know, what could be a complex route of doing different file exports, different compensation matrices and things like that. But it's a good question and it's a good thing to um, be thinking about. All right, so I will say that that has been answered. Okay. All right, so let's move on here. So on the theme of autofluorescence, right, for those of you that are not familiar with that, it's essentially the natural emission of light from molecules or structures that are inside the cell. Right? Cells are very complex. They've got a lot of organelles and things floating around in there, which if you shine a, a bright enough laser on it, uh, might emit into certain detectors. Now, the reality is that most experiments probably have some degree of autofluorescence in them, but it's really only a problem if that 
autofluorescence is interfering with the detection of your target signal. And maybe because that target signal is very dim to begin with, and now your autofluorescence just is masking that. So the good news is we can subtract that out during spectral and mixing. All we need is unstained cells and an extra detector. So with auto spill, the way that works um, is because that's gateless, it's basically just going to take your unstained cells, right? It'll assign it to, or I should say you'll assign it to one empty detector, right? Ideally, it'd be the detector where we see the most autofluorescent signal. Um, and it's going to just treat it like um, a, an extra dye, right? Like if it's an extra part of your panel, it's going to use the same linear regression technique if it sees your unstained cells kind of creeping into another detector. Um, it basically, through the linear regression, snaps it back, right? It's, that's how it's subtracting out all the autofluorescence there, okay? But again, we don't have to establish gates. Now, recognizing that people might not want to use auto spill, but they're still interested in doing autofluorescence subtraction, we've implemented another method in Flojo called true zero. And with this method, it's basically assuming that the signal in your unstained cells is completely attributable to autofluorescence. So we assign your unstained cells to an empty detector. We set the negative threshold to true zero. And that's basically telling Flojo any signal that gets detected from the unstained cells is from autofluorescence, so you're just going to set that to zero. Um, so that's basically how it's working, right? The algorithms are inherently different, so you might get slightly different results depending which one you decide to run. Um, but they're both trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to remove that background signal uh, that's attributed to autofluorescence. So what are some considerations? So this might get to the, the question a little bit that a user had in the Q&A. Um, you know, what are things to think about if we're going to do autofluorescence subtraction? Well, we definitely want the unstained cell type to match the experimental cell type, right? Even maybe go as far as processing if that's important, right? If we only see the autofluorescence because the cells got stimulated, maybe you should stimulate your unstained cells too. We want to just try to capture that as much as possible. The subtraction method, whichever you choose, right, however you establish the gate, is ultimately just going to be an average of whatever population you used for the estimate. Okay, so if you have homogenous, so basically you estimate autofluorescence in monocytes for the goal of subtracting autofluorescence in monocytes, right, that estimate is going to be more likely to subtract an appropriate amount because those are matched cell types. But it might be the case where you have um, a heterogeneous sample like PBMC. We use the bulk PBMC to average the estimate of autofluorescence. Um, but once that autofluorescence subtraction gets applied to monocytes, maybe it'll under subtract sometimes, right? When it gets applied to T cells, maybe it'll over subtract sometimes, right? These are just examples, doesn't mean it, it necessarily happens, um, but things to think about, right? If you have one cell type that's kind of dominating the autofluorescence issue, um, it, it, it might be necessary, right, to, to try to tackle it at the source than relying on a, an estimate from the average of the population of all the different cell types. Ideally, we would assign the autofluorescence to the empty channel that has the highest level of signal in the unstained cells. Right? This is often going to be the violet and the ultraviolet. It might not always be. Depends what kind of array you have on your machine. Right? If you don't even have violet and UV there, um, then your, your options become one of the other detector arrays. Okay? But if you do have a high parameter instrument, um, we're typically going to see that autofluorescence in the um, left side of the spectrum. And this is an example here right, where I have unstained lymphocytes and monocytes. And you can see right, that their signature is ultimately very similar. right? So maybe it's a little more intense for the monocytes, right? their fluorescence into certain detectors. But where those cell types are emitting um, are actually pretty much the same. Right? So in this case, maybe doing an average effect wouldn't be that big of a concern. Right? So this is one way you can also use spectral populations in Flojo, which we'll talk about in our, in our demo today, um, where we can look at these full spectral signatures for these individual populations and you know, ask the question, does it matter? Right? And you could do this for individual samples, individual populations, um, and really just ask yourself um, which cell type is going to be optimal right, to calculate that autofluorescence. And where is it a problem? Right? And in here, I can see that clearly the issue is going to be somewhere in the UV detector area. 
And that's not to say you can't do autofluorescence subtraction on a traditional cytometer. Spectral systems are just going to be better at this because, again, they capture way more information. We get a lot of detector information here, um, so more opportunities to see where that autofluorescence might be an issue and how we can use all the detectors to our advantage to profile that autofluorescence and separate it out from the rest of the signals in the sample. Um, whereas with traditional cytometer, right, we maybe get like a quarter or half of this information, so it becomes harder to, to find the fingerprint of what a, an autofluorescent signature looks like. All right, so let's start wrapping up these slides here. I realize this is um, taking more time than I had anticipated, but um, it's good because we've been getting some questions, but I'll do my best to still um, have us out of here in the next maybe 20 minutes or so. So tools to optimize panel performance, right? So, you know, even in the compensation wizard, let's say you don't have a strong desire to um, redo the spectral and mixing, you're happy with how it turned out at the instrument. But if you do calculate it in Flojo, you get some extra metrics that might be of value to you to um, reevaluate panel design or um, see if you're having any issues with gating, maybe try to pinpoint what the culprit might be. So we talked earlier about what spread is. So basically that's a measure of resolution between negative and positive populations after compensation, right? So we're not talking about spillover anymore, we're talking about spread. So here I have this Percy P Psi 5.5 single stain control spilling into the PE Psi 7 detector. And even after it's compensated so that it's only positive in its primary detector, you can see that population is still tall, right? And the reason that can be problematic is because in my full stain sample, if I'm trying to resolve a double positive population using those two detectors, it might be impeded and I might have an issue doing that. And so it doesn't mean two colors can't be used together when they have spread, um, avoid them if possible. But if you use them in your panel, we just wanna be strategic about antigen placement and maybe avoid co-express markers. And so that's more of a panel design topic. Um, and we have webinars on the Flojo website as well as on the BD website that really just dive into these topics. But the short story here is that we can give you a spillover spread matrix inside Flojo software after you've calculated compensation. Okay? We can't do this off an acquisition to find matrix because we need to reestablish the gates to get the MFIs. So here's what the spillover spread matrix looks like. Right? So you're looking at the detector right, and it's spread into the secondary. So if we see more red, that means more spread. right? So we want to avoid those detectors for co-expressing markers if possible. right? So if you're in the con in the process of designing your panel and maybe you just ran some comp beads to get started, um, it, you might want to start thinking about when you start pairing fluorophores to antigens, uh, maybe avoiding those kinds of areas. So that's spillover spread matrix, right, which normalizes dye intensity. And the reason that calculation is done that way is because it, it used to be that this metric was a way to compare um, the, per the performance of an instrument over time, right? Does it continue to separate out populations well? Um, but because it normalizes dye intensity, it can sometimes mask spillover issues that are attributed to antigen density or fluorochrome brightness. So the new advice from, from BD is if you um, are in the process of designing a panel or redesigning a panel, you might want to instead use the total spread matrix, which we can also give you in Flojo. You just have to toggle that button. And this one um, is more optimal for panel design because it doesn't normalize dye intensity. So you can still see if the spillover is going to be an issue um, and causes um, spread. So you'll still get those values in the compensation wizard. In the arena of spectral cytometry, right, we can also give you some information about full spectral signatures. So we can also give you a metric called cosine similarity matrix. Right? So because we can get full spectral signatures off of a spectral cytometer, what we become concerned with more so than spillover, so to speak, is more so how similar two dyes are on an instrument. So in this example, I have APC and Alexa Fluor 647, which on a traditional cytometer would be almost impossible to use together because they both peak in the same um, red filter de um, detector there. Um, but here, um, because there's a modest difference here in the yellow green detector area, right? So here the, I believe this is the Alexa floor, no, sorry, the APC, the lighter green line, because it um, peaks here in the yellow green detector area, um, it makes it a little bit different, right? Than Alexa floor 647. That being said, we still don't wanna purposely put ourselves in situations where we have a lot of these combinations 
of similar dyes um, because it can make the unmixing very challenging. And then we get more spread. It's harder to gate our data and harder to analyze it. So in the BD spectrum viewer, um, you can get a metric like this um, as you're building your full spectral panel. Um, and you can start to see if you have um, dyes that pairwise have a lot of similarity. It's on a score from zero to one, one meaning the dyes are basically identical, zero meaning they are very different. So ideally, we pick dyes that are very different. If we have to use dyes that are very similar, um, we again, we want to uh, put those on maybe mutually exclusive markers. And so we can give you this information also in the compensation wizard. So if you calculate a compensation there, we can give you a cosine similarity chart. So here you have all of your um, dyes. It looks like in this data, um, the parameters weren't labeled. Um, but basically the idea is you have all of your dyes, right, a column versus rows. And you can see if two dyes are uh, very similar. And right? so here I can see that I've got a YG695 detector die. And that's very similar to B710, right? Those are very similar filter numbers. So that's probably why that dye is kind of, um, you know, behaving and emitting into the same areas as like another dye. And so you can see if you have any um, areas where you have two dyes that are uh, maybe a little too similar for the panel to be used together or they need to be used strategically. But we can extend this to populations too, right? So if we consider that a dye has a full, spe full spectral signature, I mean, a population does as well, right? So the population will have um, a full spectral signature. So if we go back to that example of autofluorescent signatures for unstained cell types, we can see, right, how similar are those full spectral signatures, right? How close together are these lines? And as a user was asking earlier about if it's necessary to tease out different autofluorescent signatures, I can see that lymphocytes and monocytes basically have the same signature, right? They're, they're a cosine similarity of one. Um, so at least in my case, um, it, it's not gonna make a big difference to tease out those separately. I could use the populations together to just estimate out the, the autofluorescence contribution in the full sample. Yeah, so different ways we can use these spectral plots to our advantage. And really at the end of the day, Compensation methods, autofluorescence subtraction, all of these tools, none of that will rescue poor panel design. Okay, so I really encourage you to watch um, webinars that we have that are dedicated to this topic. Um, but it's just to say at, at Flojo, um, you know, we have another informatics platform called the BD Research Cloud that really tries to set you up for success when you're building your spectral panel um, so that you don't fall into a situation where you're having poor resolution or poor unmixing quality. So we have a panel creation resource that as you start selecting um, fluorophores for your panel, where right, you can see their spectral signatures in the form of this line map. Um, we also have a heat map visual as well. So you can start to see if you have um, a bunch of colors that are all piling in one detector. So I, I like that view for that. So you still get the similarity, right? So each die against each die score from zero to one, right? One being that they're very similar. So you still get that metric. You can also get a complexity score, which tells you in the context of your whole panel, um, you know, how many, you know, very similar dyes do you have in there. We ultimately want a lower score. Um, the higher the score gets, the more challenging the panel is going to be to do the unmixing. So we give you that metric as well. So you can compare if you have two candidate panels of the same size, ideally, right, you would take the one that has the lower score. Um, exclusive to the BD Research Cloud, we also have the BD Hotspot Matrix, right? To my knowledge, this is not available in any other panel design tool. Um, so we have this enabled for spectral panel building, which is a, an algorithmic approach to predict unmixing dependent spread. So we have engineers at Flojo, um, as well as um, in the BD engineering team um, that have, you know, worked together to basically find that if even if we build a panel where we don't see a lot of um, similarity between dyes. Um, so I build my panel, I don't see a lot of similarity. I think I'm in the clear, I run it. Um, I still have some issues with unmixing dependent spread, um, but we have found ways to predict that, right? Based on the behavior of these dyes on, on the cytometer. Um, so it's basically to say that the similarity index can be very revealing, right? If two dyes are very similar, but just because two dyes aren't very similar, right, that they're very different in the context of other colors. So once they're in the presence of all the other colors in your panel, they might be hard to separate from one another. Right? Um, so 
Um, this is just one way to, again, boost that panel performance. Um, and you can get access to this hotspot matrix if you build your panel on the BD Research Cloud. So really cool new tool. Um, we'll probably feature it in its own webinar um, in the near future. So to summarize the slides here, I mean, what are our tools for you know, spectral data in Flojo software? Well, of course, we have the compensation um, we can do on mixing, preview all of that, apply it to our data. We have an opportunity to do autofluorescent subtraction, and we can do full spectral signatures, not only for our samples, but also to profile autofluorescence as well. Um, so really harnessing all of these together um, is going to give you um, an edge at you know, looking at full spectral data um, in ways that we weren't able to outside of the cytometer before. And I thought it was worth mentioning, we're not going to talk about it in this webinar, but you know, typically if you have a spectral panel or you're thinking a spectral panel building, it's because you're entering a high parameter aspect of your work, right? You're measuring a lot of parameters um, and you're trying to fill those gaps in the, in the detector array um, so you can, we can measure more and more information. So just know we have a ton of information on our website about how you know, this all fits in a full workflow, right? So compensation would be all of the processing aspect, right? Making sure the data is top notch and everything in there is uh, can be measured reliably. Um, but then, you know, we're going to start moving forward to really facilitate discovery in our data. So we have a lot of computational tools that can help you visualize your data, automatically find populations, um, and ultimately validate that you know if those populations are present in other samples as well. So full workflow high parameter webinar is available on our website. So if you, that interests you, um, you know, please uh, visit those. All right, so I'll go ahead and move into the software and try to do a quick demo for us so we can wrap up here in the, the next maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm gonna turn off my video for now, make sure I have room on my screen for my Flojo software. All right, so let's talk about some of these features, right? So if you're interested in doing spectral unmixing, right, what is that workflow gonna look like? Okay, so let's go ahead and load in some, some spectral data that I have available here. So this is just a 15 color data set off of a Symphony A5 SE, which is a spectral enabled Symphony A5 instrument. So I've gone ahead and loaded the, the single stain controls. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. There we go. I've gone ahead and loaded the single stain controls, right? I've got one full stain sample here and I have a compensation group. So in Flojo, you always have your all samples group and you'll have a compensation group created automatically for you. Flojo typically tries to retrieve your compensation controls based on naming convention, okay, which you can change in your preferences. If it doesn't retrieve them for whatever reason, you can always select the files that you want to be in the compensation group and just drag and drop them in. Okay, right. So now I have the 17 single stain controls available in the compensation group. If you want to do compensation in Flojo, you have to use the compensation group or create a group and give it the role of compensation. Notice how if I pick the all samples bin, and try to launch the compensation wizard, it's blacked out. It's only when I select the compensation group that I'm allowed to select it because it's going to do some auto gating. So it needs to be able to find where that group is. So I have my single stain controls, right? All the ones used in my panel in my compensation group. I launch the compensation wizard. That's the spectra symbol here at the top of the workspace. So basically what will happen is if you have more detectors in your experiment than single stain controls, um, Flojo is going to ask you, well, which detectors do you want to use? Right. So two approaches here. One is you could just take them all and then in a minute we'll see that we can remove whatever we didn't use. If your detectors are labeled, right, then it becomes easy to remember which ones you actually used in your experiment. Okay, in this data, they're not. So I'm just going to pick all of them, right? So I'll multi-select all of the detectors here. But if you only have a handful and they're all labeled, it, it becomes easy to just select those. So I'm going to select them all, say choose selected parameters. 
So notice what's happening in the workspace, right? So, some, some automatic gating is going on over there. So Flojo will try to establish a size gate, which is just a scatter gate to try to find um, your beads or your cells in each of your controls. And then it'll try to do an exemplar positive gate, which is the brightest peak, right, for that single stain control in the detector that it auto assigned it to. Oh, it looks like there's something in the chat. Um, let's see. Is the Flojo spectral tool only compatible with data generated by BD instruments? How about SciTech and ID7000? Um, Koal, that's a great question. If the question is about spectral plots, which I'll get to those after we do the compensation, that is not just BD instrument. Um, it actually technically doesn't even have to be a spectral instrument. Um, not a lot of utility, I think, in looking at it in a traditional instrument, but basically it can be anything. if that's what you were referring to, the, the spectral plots. That can be for any cytometer. Yep. All right, so here's the compensation wizard. Again, we have lots of webinars dedicated to compensation, so I'm gonna try to go through this a, a little quickly, but just to highlight the spectral features. But if you wanna do spectral compensation, of course, the first decision is to, to hit the spectral checkbox, right? And that basically is gonna tell Flojo that it's gonna use all of the detectors when it does the unmixing. Your options here are traditional or auto spill. Traditional is gonna be gate-based unmixing, right? So we have to establish an exemplar negative and an exemplar positive for each of the single stain controls. If we do auto spill, that removes the need for gates, right? It basically tells Flojo to use the full range of signal in the single stain control. Okay, so spectral box for sure, if you wanna do spectral and mixing, if you want to do the auto spill implementation, you hit this button. Traditional spectral and mixing, you hit the one on the left. Single stain controls, Flojo will do its best, right, to match it to uh, a primary detector, right, based on either naming convention or, um, you know, where it detected signal in these detectors. Now you can see, right, it doesn't always get it right, particularly with spectral data, because we're collecting in all the detectors. Um, so you might have a, a single stain control that's actually, you know, might be a little bit brighter in a neighboring detector than what you would think is its primary label detector. So here's an example, right? I have the B510 single stain control made its way into the BB515 detector. That's fine. But in my BB700 detector, or at least what I call the primary one, it put the PE Sci5 single stain control. So how do you change that? You just select that sample and choose the appropriate one. Okay, so I've picked the appropriate BB700 sample, and then you make sure that you have an exemplar negative and exemplar positive. Okay, if you have unstained beads or unstained cells in your compensation group, Flojo typically assumes you want to use that as a universal negative, right? meaning that same sample will be the blue negative peak in all of your detectors which you may or may not want, right? If you have a mixture of cells and beads, you'll want to make sure that you're matching beads to beads, cells to cells. Okay, so if there's anything you don't want, you all you ever have to do is hover over a sample and you can change the gate, change the sample. Okay, all of this can be changed, right? Flojo won't always get it right. Um, so sometimes adjustments are necessary. Let me check the Q&A box here. Should we put all our FCS files in compensation group in Flojo software before we start to analyze, then use these files for the analysis? Um, let's see if I understand the question. So should we put all our FCS files in the compensation group in Flojo software before? So you only have to bring in your compensation controls if you would like to do compensation in Flojo. If you have no interest in doing the compensation in Flojo, um, there's really not a whole lot of need to bring them in, um, but uh, what you could do is, or the workflow I would say, would be to bring in all your FCS files into the all samples group. Flojo will try to retrieve your compensation controls automatically, but whatever it doesn't, you can just select the FCS files and drag it in. So that, that's the workflow I would say. And yeah, you, you could do all that before you get too deep into your analysis. All right, so again, there, there's some work to be done here, right? And, and I don't wanna to invest too much time in this. I'm gonna open a workspace where I've already set this all up, but you, you get the idea, right? We just wanna make sure we have the appropriate sample. We wanna have the appropriate negative, the appropriate positive, any gates that we need to adjust, 
I can um, interact with any of these plots. So here, for instance, let's say I need to fix this gate. I'll double click this plot. It'll open up. I can change the range gate around if I need to. Um, I can change the scaling, right? Bring my, bring my data on scale. Right? So if I've done that and now I need to fix the positive signal, okay, I'll do that. Okay, so all of this can be um, adjusted. So th there's some homework that I that would need to be done here, right? I'd need to clear detectors that I'm not using, right? Remove that, um, remove that parameter and assign the appropriate single stain controls. Okay, so I'm going to open up a workspace where I actually have this all done. So you all don't have to sit here and watch me uh, maneuver all of these things. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and launch that compensation module again. Okay. So what have I done here? Right. So all I did was I took some time right before this webinar to make sure I had the right single stain control with the right detector, the primary detector. I made sure I had good um, gates on, you know, negative and positive signals. Okay. Make sure I have a negative and positive signal for everything. If you want to do autofluorescence subtraction, you pick an, a detector you're not using, right? In this data set, they purposely assigned it to the UV379, but really I could use any of the detectors I wanted to. I select the sample and make sure it's on unstained cells. Okay, so we need unstained cells for autofluorescence subtraction. Move your mouse over to the right. The negative gets set to true zero. That's the autofluorescence subtraction method. If you pick auto spill, it will automatically use the unstained cells and that detector for the autofluorescence subtraction. Okay, but if you're not using autospill, you're just doing regular spectral, you have to pick the true zero implementation. So I made sure that was all set. Last but not least, if you do have any open detectors left and there's no single stain control assigned to it, you right click any, really any box here, and there will be uh, an option that says remove unused detectors, okay, and that clears it all out, and then everything will turn green and you can proceed. Okay, so if you have a lot of red dots, it just wants you to clear those out. Okay, so after you've calculated, or I should say once you've established the, um, the appropriate scatter gates, the exemplar negative, exemplar positive, okay, you can say view matrix, and basically you'll get an opportunity, right, to preview your compensation. Okay. So I'm going to close that real quick just so I can show you the auto spill as well. But let's say you decide to do auto spill. If you hit the auto spill button, okay, notice how all the gates disappeared. Right? I don't have any more gates inside of these graph windows um, because um, it's going to um, use linear regression right, to do the unmixing. Okay, So we don't need to have um, exemplar negative, exemplar positive gates. Okay, sorry, I don't even need the universal negative either because all of these tubes have an in-tube negative inside there, right? So, you know, I can make use of that. So it makes it easier to set up because you don't have to spend all this time drawing gates. Okay, so if you do want to do auto spill, the, the workflow would be, again, bring in the single stain controls, make sure they're at the right detectors, remove the unused ones, auto spill button, spectral checkbox, and that's going to clear the gates. And actually, I'm going to rename this matrix auto spill so that we can tell them apart. Okay, so whether you choose to do auto spill, whether you choose to do spectral and mixing, a okay, workflow would be the same. Um, when you hit the traditional spectral and mixing option, right, you'll be able to, let me check this box again. I think it's still thinking I want to do auto spill, but the, here's the optimize weights button. Okay, right? So when you hit that button, that's going to do the weighting to look for detectors that offer discriminatory power. Okay, We talked about that. Um, actually, I think it's looking for a universal negative. That's why it's not letting me. Yeah, we'll just do that for now. Um, but uh, here's the optimize weights button. Okay, so when you take that button, it's basically going to try to weight the detectors that have discriminatory power for each of the single stain controlled dyes. Um, but again, it even has a warning here that again, that's computationally expensive. Okay, but if you decide to run it and then use these weights in the future, here is a weights button where you can import or export weights that have been previously calculated in the wizard. Okay, so the idea would be you shouldn't have to do it every time if it's the same panel, same experiment, same instrument. 
you could in theory use use that same weights again. Um, but you know, worth trying if you think you have a problematic panel. All right, so either compensation technique or spectral unmixing that you use, um, you'll you'll be brought to this preview pane. Okay, so here's the acquisition defined matrix that came with the data right off the cytometer. Spillover values here. Remember, we're going to be dealing with a rectangular matrix because this is spectral data. So we're going to have more detectors than single stain controls. Down here at the bottom in black, you're looking at your data with spectral and mixing applied. Blue is without. And you can tell because there's a lot of diagonals, a lot of skewing. So that's a lot of spillover issues. That's corrected once we apply the matrix that we're looking at, which is the data in black. You can change what sample you preview, right? It probably makes more sense to preview a fully stained sample, at least to begin. And that way, if you have any double positive populations, um, it, it's easier to see if the skewing has been corrected. And we can see how the blue uncompensated data is, has all these diagonals, right? That's all because of poor unmixing or no unmixing, I should say. And then once the data is unmixed, right, we can see that these populations are more aligned. And yeah, you can also look at each of your individual single stain controls. That's probably the more comprehensive way to inspect your unmixing. Now, since we have other matrices we calculated, right, here's my traditional spectral unmixing, right? I can preview that data. I can also preview the autospill data, right, which looks a little strange probably because um, it did the autofluorescent subtraction there. Um, but if you wanted to see how they performed, you can also do an overlay. So I can manually select these two matrices and compare them to one another. And if I take off the uncompensated data, um, you know, there's some spots where the, the red matrix and the green matrix data don't align. Um, but overall, I think that they're probably fairly similar. It looks like there's some difference here in the channel for autofluorescence. Um, you could also compare it to the acquisition defined matrix. So if you see if there's even any benefit to recalculating it, um, it looks like in my case, the acquisition defined and the spectral and mixing look very similar. Um, so I'd argue there's not a whole lot of difference there. So whatever matrix you settle on, you drag the M button here in the preview pane to your data. All right, if I decide to go with the one I did, I can take this M button, apply it to my fully stained sample. Notice how the matrix is red. Okay, if I change my mind, I can go back to the gray acquisition defined and apply that sample. Now let's talk about some of the other features you get. So you get the, of course, you get the, the spillover correction. And in any matrix you calculate in Flojo software, we can get spillover spread, just say display SSM. Right now we're looking at spread. So the spread of um, this detector into that detector, this detector into that detector. Okay, so if we see more red, that means there's more spread between those two detectors. And we, you know, we probably want values below 10. Um, anything higher than that, we just want to be cautious with co-express markers. Now, this is spillover spread. Um, if we want total spread, which is the recommendation for panel design, um, you see here we have a total spread matrix. And again, we just want to try to have lower values. These are a little harder to interpret and give guidance for. Um, but I would just say if you're comparing two different panels, um, you know, you want to take maybe the one that has the less total spread. Um, and, and of course, any detectors with a lower value um, are going to be favored for co-express markers. Okay, so you get that information as well. It doesn't have to be stuck in Flojo. You can export anything out of this compensation wizard if you want to bring it to like an Excel sheet. Cosine similarity is also an option. So you can say display at CSM chart. Now this is the idea of how similar two dyes are on an instrument, right? So here I can see that, uh, let's see, everything across of course is going to be a one. But let's say for instance here, I've got a 0 0.85. So the B710 die and the YG695 die are very similar. Okay, so what do I have on B710? Um, let's see what this panel has here. Not super important, but I'm just curious. Oh, here, so BB700. Okay. So BB700 and YG695, right, it's probably some kind of PE size seven or something like that, or PE size five. 
right, it's probably not terribly surprising that they have such a high similarity because um, it looks like they're kind of um, have some peaking and similar filters, right? They both have numbers close to 700. Um, so since they have a score of 0.85, right, that doesn't mean they can't be used in this panel, but I would bet these two colors are probably not on co-express markers. Right? So if the other one's PE Sci-5, um, that's probably, let's see if we toggle this back to the this panel here. Yeah, it looks like CD95 and CD19, right? So probably not and markers where I'm going to need to distinguish co-expression there. So good antigen placement on that one. Okay, so that's the CSM chart. Okay, you can also get this as a table. Okay, so if you want to see the numbers instead of just hovering over the boxes, okay, you can still get that. It's the same information. The color scheme is the same, um, but it might be a little easier to, to read the values versus doing the interactive hover plots. Okay, so I think I went over everything in the compensation wizard related to spectral cytometry. Um, again, if you are one with deeper dive on compensation itself, we have webinars dedicated to that. So let's go explore perhaps on some of our um, spectral plot features. Okay, so let's say for instance, I want to inspect one of my single stain controls. Like I wanna check the reference spectra and see if it looks like what the manufacturer says it should look like on my instrument. I can select a sample, or maybe even pick up pick a, a cleaned up population on that sample. Go into Flojo tab, the cytometry band. In the cytometry band, there is a spectral plot button. When I hit that button, it's gonna ask, well, which detectors do you wanna visualize? Okay, you'll probably wanna take all of them. Um, and when we're looking at single stain controls, it's probably going to be more relevant to look at the raw parameters instead of the compensated ones. Okay, so I would I would pick those. So we'll say accept, right? And here's the window. Let me see if I can move my zoom controls over. Here we go. Oh, I didn't mean to draw a gate. I don't know why I did that. I'm going to delete that. There we go. I think I accidentally, oh, no, I was dragging that window around and inadvertently drew a gate there. So here's the spectral plot. Okay, so we're, again, we're looking at my, one of my compensation controls, CCR7 APC. So I would expect a lot of signal um, kind of in the red detector array. So here I've got all of my detectors at the bottom. And right? if I mouse over to the red detector array, sure enough, I've got some bright peaks there and all of the detectors I would expect for that single stain control. Okay, so if I wanted to look at this compare it to the manufacturer's brochure for that die for my instrument, right? I could I could ensure that maybe I didn't get any contamination inside of this sample. Um, now, when you're in the display, there's a couple ways to look at your full spectral signature. Okay, so if you go into the options, um, we can look at just the density. I think this is how people are probably used to looking at it, um, especially for instruments like the A5SE or the um, Cytec Aurora where we have these density bands, basically where there's a more red, um, there's a higher accumulation of cells in that part of the intensity. So for these detectors, I've got a lot of cells that are low for, for the violet detectors, um, but in the UV 660, I've got two distinct populations, right? One up here with the accumulation of a lot of cells and one down here. Um, so that's one display you can do. In options, you can also say um, show bands and remove the density. Here, this is just converting those density plots into basically just into histogram lines, right? So we have a median line, and the line above and beneath is going to be 95th and 25th percentile. Okay? But the median will be where the dots are. Okay? So you can get a, den a density plot like that. Last but not least, you can do violins. Um, I'm going to remove the bands there. So this is similar to the density map, um, but you don't get the color gradient. So it's kind of a cleaned up view of that. But they're all means to the same end. Right? It's basically just looking at where you're getting signal in that sample across the full spectrum there. Okay, so whatever you decide to use, um, it, you know, that's basically what it's trying to do. So there's your options for display. Now you can also gate in this in this view as well, right? So when we're used to establishing gates in like a biaxial plot, either in a histogram view or like a biaxial view. But here, if there is a population I become interested in, so let's say if this is the R675 
um, detector array and I want to draw a, a positive gate here, I can do that. Right? Notice how that gate shows up here in the workspace. Um, and if I want, I can you know, zone in on that population um, here in, in different views, um, or I can also use that population when I'm establishing exemplar negative and positive gates in the compensation wizard. Okay, so if you're more comfortable gating in this view to say what's negative and what's positive, um, you can have an opportunity to do that here. Okay. And you can create new populations. So here's this gate I've just established. I can say create new, right? I can call it something like, um, you know, I'm just gonna say like new gate, right? Um, so now I've got this gated population Right, available to preview right along with the parental population. And so you're basically creating children gates inside that sample if you want to preview them and you can combine them later. Any display that you want to keep, um, if you go into, I believe it's under edit. Yeah, if you do edit, you can copy the image, copy image without legend. You can also say copy content, which takes these MFI values um, and or I should say these intensity values, and you can copy and paste them into an Excel spreadsheet if for whatever reason you need those, those numbers. So let's see if I missed anything. I think this is pretty much it for the spectral populations. Let's go into, or spectral plot. Let's go into spectral populations. I really like that tool a lot. So spectral populations. So let's say for instance, I've got my unstained cells here, and I want to compare the autofluorescent signatures between lymphocytes and monocytes. So I've got two different populations that I want to see in the same window. Well, I'll pick one, or I could go ahead and pick both, and go into the cytometry band. Right next to the spectral plot button, there's a spectral population viewer. I'm going to launch that same question, right? It's asking which detectors I want to look at. Um, for autofluorescence, we'll probably want to stick with the raw, right? I'll say accept going to open up this window here, right, right, and it's already retrieved those two populations automatically, okay. So here's those full spectral signatures for each of those populations. You're going to have a legend here on the far right. Now, um, it's going to automatically put the sample name and the population. So in my case, it's like compensation control, lymphocytes, compensation control, monocytes. If you want to shorten that, I recommend going to the display and where it says population name, I would just say show only population name. That's just my preference, but I feel like it cleans up the interface a little bit. So now we're looking at monocytes versus lymphocytes, and I'm looking at their full spectral signatures. All the display options still hold true. I can do um, just look at density, right? I can bring one to the foreground, one to the background. I could also say, where's the options again? Go to just the bands, right? Maybe remove the density, clean it up a little bit. Um, but again, it's a lot of the same functionality that's in the spectral plot, but in the population viewer, we get to kind of color code the different populations um, and interact with them. So I feel like in this view, right, it's easy to appreciate that. I I definitely have some autofluorescence, right? I've got some signal coming here in the UV detector array. I could probably even compare it to a full stain sample if I wanted to. Um, and then, um, but I can also see that the the signature really between those two populations is pretty much the same. Like maybe the monocytes are a little more intense with the autofluorescence in the UV detector array. But overall, the shape of these curves is very similar right, between my lymphocytes and monocytes unstained. Um, now we could also do, where is that option at? Is it under edit, display? I was trying to look for the, ah, here it is. It's under options. So under options, we can also do similarity matrix. Okay, this is what we were talking about in our presentation. And it's, it's similar to what we're doing in the compensation wizard, right? So on a scale from zero to one, how similar are these two curves? And that's what we're seeing here, right? Lymphocytes and monocytes. So lymphocytes versus monocytes are both a one. Um, so basically saying that they're pretty much identical, which isn't easy to appreciate in this view. So here you get the chart. You, if you toggle to the table, you can sure enough see a one for all of those. So if you want the values, you can get that here. Um, similar, right? you can copy content into a spreadsheet or just copy the image right into a PowerPoint or something like that.
All right, so there's all of the different display views. Let's see if there's anything else to go over here. Um, yeah, I think everything else is just pretty cosmetic, right? You can also export the graphic as a PNG if you prefer. Um, population colors can be changed. So red and blue are just defaults established in my preferences, but I can, if I want to toggle the lymphocytes to something um, a little more dull, if I want to put emphasis on the monocytes, any color you want to change, you can just hover over the box um, and it'll expand the color palette there. Okay, so again, comparing full spectral signatures for different populations here, populations of the same sample. Now, something else you could do is if you were, let's say I'm in my full stain sample, and maybe I want to compare the full spectral signature of, let's say, my T cells and my B cells. Um, so I've manually gated these populations in my full stain sample. Now I could go again to the spectral population viewer. Um, maybe in this case, because since these samples are stained and unmixed, right? I, maybe I do want to just look at the compensated detectors instead, instead of the raw, uh, because now I just want to see, you know, how these populations separate. Right? I'm not looking at autofluorescence, and I'm not looking at, you know, contamination of my single stain controls. So I could say accept. Go ahead and open this up. Right, and and similar story, right? I I can go into the display ask to see just the population name. I don't care about the sample name. They're the same sample. Right? It's pretty easy to see that there are clear differences between these populations. Right? We can make it a little less busy, maybe remove the, the density. Um, but my B cells in blue um, are, you know, are, clearly have a lot of B710 dye, um, whereas the CD3 T cells do not. I believe B710 was the CD19 parameter. Um, so, you know, it's becoming clear to see that there are differences in these populations. And I picked two that I knew would be very different, but, you know, you could use your imagination and, to, and use two very similar memory cell types and you'd be able to eyeball, right, if, there, if one of those memory cell types is expressing um, something that the other memory cell type is not, right? Or you could take two, pop, two of the same um, population from different donors um, and compare them that way. There's so a lot of flexibility here. You can even establish a negative. Okay, so for instance, if I have this CD3, um, actually what I'll do instead is I'll go ahead and launch off of my um, unstained sample here. I'm going to go ahead and launch. Actually, I'll do the full stain. I keep changing my mind. I'll do the spectral population viewer again. Okay, now I'll, I'll go ahead and pick the raw in this case. So if I've got my uh, full stain sample here, if I did want to establish um, a negative right, to compare it to, um, in this case, if I wanted to use the uh, unstained sample, I could select that and drag it into this negative part here. Um, and that gives you, you know, like a negative comparison that you can uh, use in different calculations and things. So get an opportunity to do that too. All right, so uh, again, so spectral plots and populations, that's in the Flojo tab, cytometry, spectral plot, spectral population viewer. And let's see, last but not least, I will just drop a note about our BD Research Cloud um, because we talked so much about supporting spectral panel design that I think it's worth mentioning that if you are trying to set yourself up for success for spectral panel design, you know, we do have tools to help you with that on the BD Research Cloud. So the BD Research Cloud is a web-based tool. If you have a Flojo portal account, you technically already have credentials. It's the same Flojo credentials you use to log in to your Flojo software. Once you log in, um, you have an opportunity to navigate our panel section. We've got a lot of published panels, um, or you can create your own. So I'll quickly go to one that I already have in progress, um, just because we have webinars showing how to build a panel in the research cloud. But really what I want to get to here is to show you the spectral panel design features. So here's a panel I'd already initiated, and it gets saved in your workflow so you can come back to it. So in my spectral panel design, right, I've already picked a spectral cytometer. And in doing that, um, I get an opportunity to see full spectral signatures here. So spectral signature graph. I can also do spectral signature heat map. right? And then this is a great way to see if you're getting a lot of piling on some of your detectors. 
So I'm going to go to my spectral signature graph. When you're building your panel, right? So I've already in previous steps established all of the antigens that I want to use in the panel. So as you're building your panel, we'll show you all of the dyes compatible with your cytometer. You'll get the relative brightness. You can also toggle that for resolution. So if you want to make sure you get good separation between your populations, right? We can sort these dyes based on their brightness, based on the filter they peek in. But in terms of guided panel design, right, once you select an antigen, we'll warn you if two dyes are going to have a lot of similarity. So here, V450, it's telling me, hey, you already have pack blue in your panel, and this has a similarity of 0 0.9 with pack blue, so we don't recommend you use it. Well, let's say I decide to break the rules and use it. Now, if I go to my similarity matrix, Right, I've got a similarity score of one between those two dyes. So that's going to be really challenging, if not impossible, to use in this panel. Hotspot matrix, again, that's going to predict unmixing dependent spread. And no surprise, I've intentionally introduced two dyes that are very similar. Um, so I'm going to have some issues with um, unmixing dependent spread here. So I've got some high values, and we want to keep those as low as possible. So I can unpair that, maybe pick something that's a wiser choice, uh, maybe something like, uh, you know, let's just say Fitzy for argument's sake. And I can see that Fitzy kind of sits alone over here. It doesn't overlap a lot with any of the other colors. That's reflected in the similarity matrix, right? I don't have dyes that are very similar to one another. And in the hotspot matrix, you know, even if I did have dyes that weren't similar, Right. Can we predict any unmixing dependent spread in the context of the full panel? Looks like so far I'm in the clear. So again, all in one step, you have everything you need. Full spectral signatures, hotspot matrix, similarity matrix, warning you about dyes that are going to have high similarity, telling you which dyes you've already used, and telling you the brightness of dyes um, as well as their resolution score. So really powerful tool for a spectral panel design. Um, highly recommend it. So let's check the chat here. Um, last question. Why is BD Research Cloud not available in Africa? That is a good question, Andrew. I know we are, you know, working diligently to to release in, in different countries. Um, if you email me, I can inquire about a potential release date for that region. Um, but, you know, the short story is every region has its own, uh, you know, regulations and, and things that we have to go through to have it released in a particular part of the world. Um, so I, I, I'm i sure that we it's on the, the list, um, but at least to my knowledge, I don't have a release date yet for you. But if you send me an email, I'm happy to inquire about that for you um, and see when we can get you on that tool. All right, so I think I attempted to cover everything I wanted to cover today. I'll end by saying for those of you that asked about the recording, if you go to Flojo website, learn tab, webinars section, here's where you saw probably our upcoming webinar. This is the one you're in now. Once the recording is posted, you can go to the recorded webinars section. And there you'll see a library of all of our recorded webinars most recent ones should show up right about here. And please visit any of our previously recorded webinars if you have any questions about topics that we may be breezed through a little bit today, like compensation, high parameter workflows, or even the BD Research Cloud. If you're fascinated with what I just showed you on the previous page, um, learn more about that. We've got whole webinars on that topic. So I will go ahead and pause here, turn my camera back on. And I will go ahead and put just a parting slide here. Here is my email address just one last time um, in case you would like to contact me about any follow-up questions or anything that remained unclear. Um, but I'll hang on here for an extra minute and see if there's any questions in the chat. Otherwise, um, I will wish you all a good rest of your day or a good evening if you're um, just about to have dinner or something like that. It, it's dark out on my side of the world. Um, but for those of you that are just starting your day, um, I hope you have a great day and thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope you learned something that will be valuable for your spectral cytometry experiments. And thanks for joining. <laughs>